I'm Holly. And I'm Bridget. And this is Girls Next Level. (laughs) Welcome back to Girls Next Level podcast. We have a really fun interview for you guys today. But before that, what are you doing today, Bridget? You know what? It's been kind of a crazy day. We had a rabbit stuck in our garage. What do you mean? Like a wild rabbit. Like, I don't know how it got in the garage, but it like came in. Um, must have been when we were pulling a car in or something. And all of a sudden, Nick went out to the garage to do something. And he and, there were, and he, the door hit the rabbit. No. Well, I mean, not not like in a hard way oh, or okay. whatever, but but just enough so that he saw it. And he saw the ears and everything. So we know for sure it was a rabbit. It ran and it jumped in this little hole that goes like, into this like weird crawl space under the house so we had to open up like the vent intake thing because it can't get back out where it jumped into like we could barely get anything in there it's like so narrow so we were like coaxing it out and put out little berries and water for it to get it to go back outside oh so it's been an eventful eventful day i have to tell you we had a one of our reels on the Girls Next Level Instagram go viral. And I know I told you about it, but for the listeners, so on our Patreon a couple weeks ago, we did a slumber party episode reviewing the America's Sweethearts Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders Netflix documentary. And I posted a reel that was a clip from that episode where you're saying, oh, you know what's so creepy is all the yes ma'ams. Because if you guys haven't seen the documentary, when the women enter the training camp, they cut them a lot in sequence saying, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Because, and I can't say enough about how well done this documentary is, but I feel like that was a choice because they wanted us to feel like you're in boot camp now, like it's tough, it's tiring, and be kind of scared of these coaches, you know? So, yeah, well, you and were- also that there is no other answer than yes, ma'am. There's no excuses. There's not trying to explain yourself. Anything they say to you is answered with yes, ma'am. And then I go on to say, I feel old when people call me ma'am, because I was probably like in my late 30s when I first noticed people calling me ma'am. People probably did before that, but you know, you don't get self-conscious of it until you're older. But this reel has been on our page for like two weeks and all the comments we would get on it were like pretty much all positive and people saying, oh no, ma'am is just a sign of respect. It's not an age thing. I call 12 year olds ma'am. But yesterday I go to the Instagram page and I look at the comments And all of a sudden, that reel is getting inundated with so much hate. And I'm reading all these hate comments of people calling us like, old, we're ruining any chivalry, you know, women don't want to be treated with respect. And this is proof and just all these angry, angry people. And I'm like, wait a minute, what happened? And all of a sudden, like the reel went from like 100,000 views to like 900,000 views. Like it's probably at a million now. And it was just like, I was like, what happened? Because clearly someone must have shared that video or talked about it and like exposed the video to a whole other platform because people have no idea the context we're talking about. Like it's clear from the comments that they think we're just complaining about people being polite. They don't know we're talking about that documentary. Um, And in the real, we're wearing the Dallas Cowboy cheerleader uniform, but still nobody's putting two and two together. And also another thing that's clear is it's clear that none of these people know us at all, because based on the comments they're leaving, I think if they did know who we were, they'd be adding a lot of, oh, you pose nude and clearly your only answer is yes, you know, like they'd be saying like that if they knew. So clearly they don't know, but it was wild. And I'm just so curious, like who shared the reel? So if anybody out there like saw the reel being talked about on some other platform or somebody with a huge following, like shared it, let me know. Cause I just love a mystery. Like I'm not even offended by any of the comments cause they're so silly, but I'm just really curious, like why the sudden interest? Because this happened literally overnight. Like that reel was up for two weeks with nothing. There were some good comments though. Let me share a couple of the good comments. Okay. Well, some of the, one of the comments was like, some guy really thought he was digging in and he goes, yeah, well, you guys look almost 35. And as a 45 year old woman, I'd like to say thank you. (laughs) And also a bunch of people thought we were actual Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, which I think those girls are so gorgeous. So thank you. Because people were like, oh, this is why the Cowboys suck. Oh, okay. Now the cheerleaders are officially overpaid in my mind. (laughs) It was ridiculous. And I, 
just screenshot a few more comments. Let me share because I think they're so funny. Um, they didn't get beat when they were growing up and it really shows. Get over it. It won't stop just because you don't like it. Tell me you had a silver spoon in your mouth for your entire life. And then people are like, then go up north. Then move out of the south. No one is forcing you to stay here. Spoiler alert, we don't live in the south. It's just like if we call our girl who are in a relationship with our old lady, we aren't actually calling you old. It's more of a meaningful statement. So oh, I no. just think these comments are so funny. And my other favorite thing about these comments is a lot of people are like, it's just manners. You, f you know, it's just like people are like all preaching manners and then they'll like throw like the worst insult. So I think it's wild and I low key love it. And I'm just dying to know who is responsible for giving us all these views. Well, like Nick and I hate that when people say, oh, my old lady or like my ball and chain or stuff like that. Like both of us hate it when people refer to their wives like that. Oh, that, w that wouldn't be my jam either. I wouldn't like, like it. You said so <laughs> many people at work refer to their wives or girlfriends like that, the old lady or the ball and chain or whatever. And he's just like, Jesus, if you're so unhappy, like. Yeah. <laughs> it's not okay. You know what's funny is this is not the first time this has happened to me. Tell me. So a long time ago, I mean, probably like 2017, whenever I was doing all my YouTube videos, mm -hmm. um, I had a YouTube hot second, you know, and I uh, posted like different food, m making different food things and different makeup things or whatever. And one day I thought I'm going to make like beignets, like from Cafe du Monde beignets. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I make the dough and everything and I have this pot of oil and I'm like super scared of the oil because you have to like get it up really high to actually deep fry something and I don't deep fry food so this is my first time like pouring a gallon of oil into a pan and like waiting for it to get hot and I'm afraid I'm gonna burn the whole place down and I'm commenting about it as I'm going and I never did get my oil hot enough and so the uh -huh. beignets didn't turn out they were cut they didn't puff up like they were supposed to they still tasted okay but they weren't they weren't Cafe Du Monde. Okay. Yeah. And, um, but I still posted the video anyway, because I thought that it was a good thing to show flop sometimes. Like a lot of, most things turn out amazing, but sometimes they don't. And I feel like that's good to share those times too. So I posted it. It was up forever. Like, I don't know. I don't even know how long, but at least a year, if not more. Uh huh. It got the normal amount of whatever comments and, and normal amount of views or whatever. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was <laughs> getting like hundreds of comments and thousands of, of, of views. And people were like, and I forget even who it was. It was like a radio show host or something. They were like, TJ and brothers sent me and or, <laughs> TJ. Or, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who it was, but they were, and, but everybody's like, oh, so-and-so sent me. This girl sucks. This girl's lame. Oh, she's so stupid. Oh, she doesn't even know what oil is. She doesn't even know how to turn. Oh, you got to turn the burner on, lady. And like, oh making, my... just like capping on it. And there were a few people that went on and were like, oh, wait, that's actually, actually that's Bridget from the girls next door. <laughs> Oh my God, but, that's so, so funny. A few people did like that were sent by this radio station did like know who I was, but like most people did not. And they were just like saying all oh, this weird to me <laughs> to the point where I had to take the video down. Like it just wouldn't stop. Oh my God. <laughs> that is so funny. At least they had the decency to tell you where they came from though, because I'm so curious who shared this because people yeah. are just getting the wrong idea. Yeah, they all said so and so sent me. I can't remember who it was though, but I was just like, what is this person? <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. They obviously have a huge following and whoever sent this out had a has a huge following. Oh, totally. It's crazy. So thanks for the viral videos. I love it. So we're so excited to give you guys this episode. Should we get into the interview? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Am I crazy that I like to look cute when I work out? <laughs> There's not even anybody here to see me typically. I mean, maybe Nick, but he doesn't really care what I look like when I work out. And then, of course, you want it to be comfortable. Like, it can't be tight in weird places or weird sizing or too stretchy or too restrictive or, like, weird colors. 
<laughs> and sometimes there's never enough pockets, especially when I'm going to go outside and do something active. Like when I'm working at home, okay, it's fine. But like when I'm going to go on a hike or something, like I need lots of pockets. Like I want to store my phone and my key and my whatever else I need to bring with me on that hike. And Roan has stepped up to the challenge. The new Roan's women's course to court collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and truly versatile set of dynamic activewear on the market. They cater to tennis, pickleball, and golf enthusiasts, but honestly, like I wear it just even just upstairs on my Peloton, the course to court collection is designed to keep you focused on your next best move with premium dresses, quarter zips, polos, skorts, and more. I'm obsessed with my Roan tennis dresses. In fact, I wore one recently in the episode where we interviewed producer Molly. So I know you guys saw it because I got a lot of compliments on it. I love a preppy tennis look. If I could wear that 24 seven, I totally would. And especially the Roan outfits. The style is so easy to wear. They're easy to even like go to the bathroom in. Like you don't have to take off the whole dress. It's very innovative. They have chafe free seams hidden liners with drop-in pockets subtle back openings and they even have odor free tech it's treated with gold fusion anti-odor technology for more wears between washes i love my tennis dresses the course to court collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next head to roan.com slash next level and use promo code next level to save 20 percent off your entire order that's 20 percent off your entire order when you head to roan r-h-o-n-e dot com slash next level and use code next level roan for every day for every you forever forward welcome back to girls next level everybody i'm so excited to do this interview today because bridget and i have one of our favorite people here she was a producer on girls next door for so many seasons and she worked on the spinoff so i feel like i've known her my whole adult life and she's one of our favorite people and the biggest ray of sunshine welcome becca gullion hey yeah I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for asking me to be a part of this. It was, I'm really excited. Thanks for doing it. We wish we could be with you in person. We'll have to make a trip out to Texas. (laughs) That's what I was just going to say. I wish we could do it in person. (laughs) Yes. We'll have to, you know, reconvene at a later time when, when you get a little further along. I mean, I can't believe you've been doing this. What? Like, Two years? Has it been two years? Yeah, two years. We just finished talking about season two of the show, and we definitely want you back when we talk about season five. We'll ask you a little bit about it today, but I know when we get to season five, it's going to be like unraveling this big ball of yarn because everything was so messed up that season. It's crazy. And I mean, even just when you asked me to do this, you know, it just... It was wild to think that I started the show 20 years ago. And so that was just, you know, a tough pill to swallow. But, you know, just also (laughs) such an interesting one because this this show was such a huge part of my life for so many years. Yeah, it's so crazy. For everybody at home, will you tell us a little bit about how you grew up and where you grew up and how you got interested in the entertainment industry? Yes, definitely. So I am a Los Angelino native, uh, born and raised um, with my mom. She um, was a child actress and it was actually around the age, I believe, of four. They had a neighbor who was a casting director and essentially thought my mom and her sister would be a good fit for TV. And so my mom started a career at the age of four Um, and had a pretty lucrative career on TV. One of the shows that she was on uh, was Lost in Space. And so what's interesting, and and I can kind of get to that, but that was my segue into Kevin Burns and and getting, um, you know, on with the Girls Next Door team and and with him. But I'll circle back to that. I I basically went to college at Long Beach, and I thought I was going to be a dancer. I was on the dance team there, and that was my life. And when I had an injury, um, I, I was like, my life's over. What am I going to do? Um, and explored a bunch of stuff. And Long Beach had a great film department. And so I started to kind of dabble in some TV and film classes. And it was interesting to me. And it was at that time that I spoke with my mom and I said, hey, you know, Kevin Burns, Like, I wonder if I could go work for him. Um, And I was a junior in college, actually, when I reached out to Kevin. 
And Kevin was an executive producer for a and &E Biography, and he did a lot of biographies and had a, an overall deal with 20th Century Fox. So he hired me as an intern. And then it wasn't until I graduated college, and then I just basically said, I really want to want a job. You know, can I, can I continue to work for you? And Kevin hired me. And so it's interesting because that's how, you know, everything started. And wasn't your mom also one of the kids in Sound of Music? Yes, she was. Brigitte Von Trapp. Brigitte that's, Von Trapp. That's so cute. Yeah. So, I mean, and that was really interesting. You know, my mom was a child actress, but when she gave birth to me, um, she she did put acting, you know, to the wayside and, and wanted to be 100% mom. And she did own a gift store in Toluca Lake while I was growing up. So I had parents who essentially were business owners, you know, and a mom who I'd go to the grocery store with and people would recognize. So it was kind of interesting because she was just a normal mom to me. But, um, you know, she when I was younger, she definitely had a lot of people who... Uh, would would call her out and recognize her more so than now. Was the girls next door your first job or did you have other projects he put you on? Yeah, so it wasn't. Um, when I first started working for Kevin, I started at the bottom. So I was an intern and then I was an executive assistant and then I was a PA on uh, a couple Animal Planet projects, like um, Animals on Wheels. <laughs> and... You know, <laughs> We're like, so bizarre, but hey, they worked, right? We did it. But yes, so I started out as a PA. I think like what was great about Kevin is that he did allow me to do all the jobs. And I'm very grateful for that because I think it gave me such a great entry point into this industry and just being able to do all the jobs. Like I never rose, you know, too fast or too quick. In fact, I begged Kevin. For, to be on the girls next door. And he dangled that carrot for so long. I, oh. yeah. So yeah. Season one, I was like, can I please work on the show? Can I please work on the show? And he's like, nope, you can't. You have to do, yeah, you're not ready. And we'll get to it later, but that's kind of a parallel because when we started Holly's World, I begged to have you on my show, like begged. <laughs> <laughs> so he's getting it from all ends. Yes. <laughs> So how did the transition finally happen into Girls Next Door? You know, like I said, I kept asking, Kevin, I'm ready, please. Like, I, I want I want to do more. Like, I'm so much more capable. Give me the opportunity. And he made me a story assistant on, I think it was called High Maintenance. It was High Maintenance 90210. Do you guys remember that? I do, because yeah. after Girls Next Door took off, E gave him another assignment, and they're like, please do this show about, like, assistants and people working yes. for, like, rich people in L.A. And he showed me an episode, and he used the same sound effect in High Maintenance 90210 that he used to use when my dog Duchess would waddle across the screen <laughs> in Girls Next Door. And I looked at him, and I was like, that's my sound. <laughs> no. And he's just, he made, he made that face. He goes, uh-huh. And I was like, don't you oh, Lord. I thought those were our sounds, their stock sounds, but it was so like unique to Girls Next Door. I was like, oh, how dare you use that on another show? <laughs> yes, that's so funny. And he put me on that show and I was like, no, I want to do Girls Next Door. But at the same time, I was also like, okay, finally, he's putting me on something else. Um, and so I worked on that, kind of proved myself in post because I started in post. And then it was finally on season two that Kevin allowed me to come on to Girls Next Door in a post role capacity as like a story assistant. I mean, he was really holding out. So I'm assuming you must have liked the show if you wanted to work on it. What was kind of your impression of like what we would be like and what working on the show would be like just from like viewing and backstage? Yeah, I mean, yes, I, of course, I was intrigued. I think, you know, just as an overall, you know, the Playboy Mansion was an intriguing place. The world of Playboy was an intriguing world. Um, you know, I had a cousin growing up who always went to the Playboy Mansion for the Easter egg hunt, like when they do that for the kids. So I remember like those stories. And I just think that what was so interesting to me was it was 
a peek into a world that felt, you know, very off limits in terms of like revealing, you know, all the stuff that went on behind closed doors, but it was showing it in such a different light through the girl's POVs. And that felt empowering to me. Uh, plus like the comedy piece I was really excited about because I liked that it was light. You know, I liked that it wasn't salacious and mean. You know, to this day, people look at my credits and they go, what was it like working on Girls Next Door? I mean, it is always a question. People always want to know what it was like. It, 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 you know, so I think back then before I was even a part of it, I was interested too. Like I wanted to be a part of that. Well, we're glad you got to be a part of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Once you got transferred into the field, like did you expect it to be a long-term job or like, were you like, I'm holding on to this? Because there was some heavy turnover at first. Like I feel like I barely got to know some of the people at the beginning. I felt like every half a season, it was like new producers. Yeah, and it's so interesting you say that because when I think back, absolutely, there was so much turnover. There were people coming in and out. A lot of people did not stay long, but I don't think I ever was putting that really together in the moment. I, I think once I was able to go into the field, you know, Bridget, I was, it was like I had, I felt like I had made it. Like I was really excited. I was like, this is a goal that I've set for myself. And, and here I am, like, I've not only proved myself to Kevin and we know what Kevin is like, you know, and your viewers, I'm sure at this point know what, yeah. you know, what Kevin is like, but he was tough, you know, and he was definitely going to try to retain that control. And I think, you know, that also meant a lot to me because when he allowed me to go into the field, I felt like I really earned it. So when I, when I was there, I, I don't know if I was thinking at all about, oh, what if I get fired? I was like, I'm holding on to this job. I'm going to do the best job I possibly can. I'm going to work my ass off and I'm going to have fun doing it. And look, I think I really cut my teeth on this show. Like I really did. You know, this was my entry point into unscripted television in that capacity. And, you know, 20 years later, here we are, you know, yeah. <laughs> doing the same thing. Yeah, I just, as the show went on from season to season, I just really liked the show more and got more comfortable and got to know the crew better. So, yeah, it was a whirlwind, but I'm glad it worked out the way it did. Who's looking to add a little extra spice in their life out there? Well, I recently started listening to romance audiobooks on the Dipsy app while running my errands and like crossing all those things off my to-do list has never been more entertaining. Grocery shopping with a hot lesbian cowboy in your ear is a totally different experience. Tell me something I wouldn't know just from looking at you right now. I'm getting wet. Oh, come. Full sentences, please. I need to... I'm wet for you. Just being near you. Oh, you're so needy. Oh, yes, I am. That was a clip from The Ticket, a spicy sapphic audiobook exclusively on Dipsy. Every month, Juliet flies Reese to a new destination. From a yacht in Greece to a cathedral in London, these two know how to have a little fun. Where will they meet up next? Download the Dipsy app to find out. Dipsy is the female-founded app for spicy audiobooks and more. Created by women for women, their app has over 1,000 spicy audiobooks, all crafted by a team of professional writers and top-tier narrators. Whether you're looking for a rugged cowboy or a Scottish sailor, fey royalty, or the god of the underworld, you'll find characters you love on Dipsy. With their easy-to-explore app, you can search for your favorite romance genres like contemporary, historical, dark, sports, western, romance, sapphic, and more. New chapters are released every week, so you'll always find something new to enjoy. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash next level. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash next level. Dipsystories.com slash next level.
I remember one time, remember that show, The Soup on E! with Joel McHale, yeah. where he would just like comment on pop culture stuff. I remember him making fun of Girls Next Door having such a long lead time. He'd be like, all right, it's October and we're watching the Girls Next Door in Super Bowl because it takes them eight months to do a show. <laughs> I'm like, you know, spot on. <laughs> Totally. Wasn't that also the goal? Like, didn't we all want to be on the soup? Because I remember Kevin being like, we got to get on the soup, you know, like we got to make the, we call it water cooler talk, right? We're like water, you know, pe what people are talking about. I well, did not have any expectations of being on the soup. <laughs> me either, but I'm glad he got his goal. I'm glad he checked that off. <laughs> Becca, I'm dying to know. I love to know what people's first impression of the mansion is. So like the first time you went there, like what, what did you think? I mean, the first time I went to the mansion, I was like, holy shit, I'm at the Playboy Mansion. This is, you know, you take it all in, you know, it's such this place that like, it, you know, not everyone can go to and you have, it's invite only and it's only special. And all of a sudden it, it really did become a second home for me. So I think like my first impression was, wow, you know, on the surface, it's just, it's just really cool and really neat. And I think, you know, the more time I spent there, you know, you see the dust on the mantle, you know, you see the things that are under the rug. Like, you know, it's not all perfect and pretty all the time, but my favorite part about the mansion always was um, the grounds. Like sometimes even after we'd eat crew lunch, I just like go solo walk. And I just walk, you know, down to where the animals were or, you know, just kind of take a, just go and sit on the, the huge side lawn and just kind of look out and just take a moment. So it's so pretty. It was just, it was really, really beautiful. Um, and I loved that part. Yeah. The grounds and the zoo were really special. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it was just, it was so pretty. And the birds, I loved the birds. Yeah. And then do you know the first party that I ever went to at the Playboy Mansion, which was before I even worked on the show? What was what? it? I was invited to the 50th anniversary uh, Playboy party. Oh, that was an interesting one. I remember filming that. Yes. And this was during the Mean Girls era. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. very grumpy during it because I felt like we didn't have anything to do. We were just kind of like pieces of meat, which I don't know why it just occurred to me that day that that was my role. And I just remember being really grumpy at that party. <laughs> That's so interesting because this is before I was ever, you know, Girls Next Door wasn't even a thing, right? At this point. Yeah. That's going way back. What was that? Like 2003? 2003, yeah. 2003, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and my mom and I actually went together. Um, and we, we had so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Cause Kevin I'm made a special on did. that for A and E. Because yeah. I remember having a terrible time at that party too. It was, you know, like Holly said, it was the height of the mean girls era. And I just remember them, everybody, you know, thinks that this is their big opportunity. We're going to be on TV and stuff. And I just remember feeling a lot of tension. Like people were like very vying for their spot and, and trying to get attention for the cameras and be funny or look sexy or whatever. And I was just like, Oh, this is like nightmare city for me. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, wow. That, see, that's so interesting. I didn't even know you girls at that point. It's yeah. just crazy to think time and time and space, right? Yeah. So, I'm curious, once you became a producer, how involved in the storylines were you? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, Kevin was really particular. There were a lot of, you know, we had meetings all the time about creative. And I mean, Kevin definitely did welcome ideas. Um, you know, we were a constant machine of throwing ideas out. And what was great about the girls next door is that you had your tent pole events that were going to transpire. So it's like, we knew we had Midsummer's, We knew we had Hef's birthday. We knew we had all of y'all's birthdays. You know, we knew that there were those things that were always going to happen every single year. And, you know, I don't know if you remember, but when I became a producer on the show, I would go and individually talk to each of you about what was happening in your lives. 
And do you remember that? Like, I remember spending real good quality time. I would stay like after we wrapped and I would stay, you know, or I would get there early and we would talk because for me, that was really important. And I I knew for Kevin that it was always a little more angled towards like with Hef and like what he was okay with. And he probably wasn't going so deep with what was actually happening in each of your lives and what we wanted to bring to the forefront, what was important to you. And and that became really important to me is I, I wanted to know, you know, as we evolved too, you know, what was really going on and to elevate you as women and characters on the show. Um, and so I know that I would bring those to Kevin and I feel, I wish I could remember like which ones ended up sticking and which ones didn't, but I do think we got some across the finish line. Um, Kevin was also notorious for like turning down someone's idea and then regurgitating it as his own. A hundred percent. He's a total regurgitator. Like I'd give him an idea and he'd go snore yeah. like that was boring. So boring. Yeah. and then I swear just a day later like the turnaround was not very long he'd be like I know yep. and then he'd spit back out what I just said yes and you'd be like I just pitched that to you <laughs> so funny. Was, yeah so that happened a lot <laughs> Well, we appreciate you so much and just the time you took getting to know us and get what we wanted across. Because I think with Girls Next Door, like we were always so hungry to like have a little bit more to chew on with the show and go a little bit deeper as much as we could. And I think that did happen a little bit as each season progressed. And, you know, I didn't know all of the ins and outs of what, you know, you were dealing with personally, Holly, at the time. And, you know, Bridget, I know that you and I got really close on the show and, and, you know, I would really try to, you know, connect with you and and really learn you and understand because I think trust is just such a huge part of being a good producer. And, you know, I am not the kind of producer that goes in and just tries to like manipulate a situation. I think it's, I think you get more with trust, you know, and if I can say to you, Hey, like we really want this, you know, to be like this funny moment, you know, you might not look so great in the moment, but ultimately like we're going to get to the point where you are the hero, right? Or you, we, but we got to get there. We can't just like wrap it all up in this. And I'd have those talks with you in scenes. And, and I think it helped you to get into that place where you felt safe and you knew I wasn't going to take advantage. And what I was going to say though, is that as time went on, I think we really had strength in that with our relationships. And I know I saw you both grow. Um, I saw Kendra grow too, obviously, like by the end, she, you know, but, but you in particular too, Holly, like I saw a totally different person, like when we wrapped up and then you went on to Vegas and like you went to do Holly's world, you were like this butterfly, you know, that just like came out of her cocoon. And that was so neat for me to see because I think the show really helped tap into some of those things and and really like allow you to be the people you were meant to be. I think so too. Like, you know, I'd been in the relationship with Hef for four years by the time the show started and I was kind of broken when the show started. I was just very much like self-esteem in the gutter, just felt like, I'm never going to be able to do anything but be here with him. So might as well like try and make it work, like tiptoeing around. And the show and working at the studio like really helped give me my confidence back and get me out of it. I loved that for you. That was like such the perfect little segue into like having something that was truly like your own, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, you know, that was, that was something else that I just, I always found so impressive with the two of you, you know, Kendra was not like this at all, but you two, you were always prepared. Like you always had ideas, you know, and it felt the, the longer we went on so much more like a collaboration, you know, where, you know, you'd be like, Oh, I really don't feel comfortable, you know, talking about that. Or I don't feel comfortable saying that. Okay, great. Well, what about this? And I throw something at you and you're like, okay, yeah, like I could do that. And then I'm like, okay, well, great. You know, it was, it was a lot of that. And I, I I loved that about the both of you is that it was never just such a hard line in the sand. Like, no way we're not going to do that. We would work together to figure it out. Okay, cool. Like, what is the best story here? Like, this is actually really great. You're showing vulnerability. You're, You're peeling back the layers. 
that was a line I always had. Like, come on, let's show the onion. Let's get in there. I want to see the real you. And I think we did. We accomplished that. Definitely by the end, for sure. Yeah. Did you have a certain type of favorite type of plot line you like doing on Girls Next Door? Like, did you love the travel or the parties or the more creative things or the more intimate things? 100% the travel. Like, I, and and 100%. You know, I said, you know, I say this, you know, to a lot of people, but when I think about the show, I'm like, I am so lucky. Like, I got to travel VIP on a show that went multiple seasons, a hit show that went multiple seasons, to some of the coolest spots, to do some of the coolest things, all, you know, in a very, like, VIP way, you know? I mean, Kentucky Derby, for example. Like, I also remember the $1,000 uh, mint julep. Yes. Oh, my God. I was on a Disney cruise with my kids over spring break, and we were walking. I took Rainbow out to go to the bathroom, and then we were walking back into the restaurant, and this guy took me aside, and he goes, oh, hey, Holly. I know, And I go, I'm with my daughter right now, a.k.a. don't say anything inappropriate. And he goes, no, 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 you'll like the story. He goes, I was there when you came to the Kentucky Derby, and I made you your first ever mint julep. No way. Isn't that so funny? That was, so was he like the guy that did it table side? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I remember that whole thing. There's a part of me as a producer on the show, you, you get inundated sometimes like in the moment where people will come up and be like, okay, where's the producer? And they'd be like, Hey, you know, we really want to do this nice thing for the girls. We really want to do this thing for half. We really want to do. And so we not only be trying to get a show, but we'd often be fielding, you know, all of these cool things that people wanted to do for you guys, like in the moment. And I remember, I'd, it's so interesting because I'd sometimes run them by you, but I'd always have to also run it by Hef. Is this something that you feel comfortable with? Is this something you want? And I feel like that mint julep was one of those things where they were like, we have this thousand dollar mint, mint julep in a gold cup. And I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Most of you guys probably know all about June's journey by now, but for those new people out there, it is a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story taking you back to the glamour of the 1920s with a diverse cast of characters. Each new scene takes you further through a thrilling murder mystery story that sets the main protagonist, June Parker, on a quest to solve the murder of her sister and uncover her family's many secrets. Some of my favorite things about the game is that it's a hidden objects game. So I love looking for clues and objects to uncover a murder mystery. Stop it. That's right up my alley. Not to mention that it takes place in the roaring 20s, in the parlors of New York to the sidewalks of Paris. Like you can't beat that. It's total escapism to a bygone era of mystery, danger, and romance. And you can customize your very own luxurious estate island, which you know I'm loving that. You can just let your imagination run wild. And if you really want to, you can chat and play with or against other players by joining a detective club. You'll even get the chance to play in a detective league to put your skills to the test. I love playing June's Journey when I'm like waiting for an appointment or just have a few minutes to spare in between things. It's a great time. Oh, the airport is a great time. Oh, me too. Anytime I need to relax a little bit and I have my phone in my hand, like if I'm in the waiting room at the doctor's office or something like that, I go straight to the hidden object games. They're challenging enough, but they're also relaxing and I like it and they're pretty to look at. Immerse yourself in the glamorous world of June Parker. Can you crack the case? Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. I was excited because I thought that, you know, I, I mean, you probably remember this, but they always would like focus on me eating and make yeah. eating like a big deal. And I thought I was excited because I thought kind of after season two that that was really going to die down. But like I'm getting ahead and I'm watching season three right now. And if anything, I think it gets worse. And I was just yeah. curious. It's, it bothers me. It, it haunts me to this day with people thinking that I'm the heavy one of the group and that, you know, a million things. And I was just curious. It's a trope that bothers me. And I was wondering if there were any storylines or tropes that Kevin would insist that, that you didn't love working on. It was honestly, it was that one. I mean, you know, the whole 
making Bridget like the eater, like the heavy one, which, you know, you weren't, you know, I mean, we're both foodies. I know we bonded over that before, but um, that was a reoccurring joke. I mean, that Kevin really did like to push and I think he thought it was funny and, you know, I was like, oh, can we tone down the fat shaming? Because I remember it was all, you know, at that point, we didn't call it that. But like, oh, gosh, you know, this might be like sensitive. Let's not, you know, like put in all the stuff. I remember being uncomfortable about it. And also, like, again, knowing you and knowing, you know, what our relationship and I mean, it's just it's not nice, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that that would absolutely be it that for me sometimes i wonder how that didn't lead to an eating disorder for me you're very strong (laughs) because watching it back now i feel like oh god like i need to starve myself like i shouldn't be eating that i can't you know but then i was just like i'm just living my life i'm just enjoying things i'm not doing anything weird or anything that anybody else wasn't doing they just focused on me doing it and i think i knew that at the time but watching it back you forget what everybody else was doing you're like was i eating so much more than everybody else you know no but I think like just in the editing and in just in the way you know that you can you know pull the sound ups from all you know and place audio in there and you know make it more than what it was you know you might have just been like ooh, the crafty I, I remember like when the bunny house shot at the mansion and I remember you have I, mean, I, re- I think I was there like following you and it was it was so cute. You're like, I love the craft service table. Like, I love the catering. Like, by the way, who doesn't? Yeah. Um, but that became a moment. I remember in the edit where they were like, oh, Bridget's like on the hunt for food. Or like, Bridget again is bringing up the crafty table. And I think, you know, even in, in each episode, like you may have already said it, you may have said it once, but it did kind of become that reoccurring, you know, thing for, for, as a character point for you, you know, which is unfortunate and I'm sorry, but like you think about that stuff, you know, in the moment, I remember feeling uncomfortable about it then. And now that we're talking now, I'm like, holy shit, that's so fucked up. You know, if there was anything you could have done different on girls next door, like done it your way, what would you have done different? I mean, I think, I think maybe show a little bit more about the realities of, like the half piece, you know, but I also don't think it would be the show that it ended up being if that was the case, because it might have gone a little too far, you know, the other way where people would have, you know, would have maybe turned a little more salacious or a little more nasty, you know, or a little more uncomfortable. Yeah, it definitely wouldn't have been like the you know, a TV that it was. Yeah. And again, I still look at this show and, and that's exactly what it was, you know, to this day, you know, people are really like, they're like, Oh, I know who I was. Like, I know which girl I, you know, connected with the most. And, and everybody had that, which mm-hmm. is really, I love that about the show. I'm curious, did the network or production ever give you notes about like getting more nudity or anything or anything weird like that oh yeah we definitely yes there was there were definitely some notes where and whether or not it actually happened or not because I still think we you know we definitely had rules on on what could or couldn't be but there were definitely some notes through the years that were like more TNA more TNA um I don't need to name names, but we can talk about that offline. I know exactly who it was. <laughs> yeah, don't forget to tell us. The reason I I'm shocked idea. about it is because I know those notes were happening like from the network in season one. And I just kind of assumed that it tapered off over the years. I didn't know it kept going through like seasons two and three. And Yeah. Yeah, I wonder like how Hef felt about that. So he probably wanted like more n- nudity than we had, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious yeah. if there was ever any like mandate from production, like, okay, it's really sensitive about like how much time we give each girl. So let's try and like keep that even. Um, no, there was never like a mandate. And I ultimately, the way we would kind of gauge it is, you know, when we get back into post and we'd really see like, oh, okay, where are the stories? You know, something that was really cool about Girls Next Door, because we shot all the time, 
is that Kevin would be like, I want the story this way. And we'd go into the field with the intention of shooting the story that way. And then the story would not turn out that way. And then we would have a whole new story. And I would call those the golden nuggets where we are like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. Sometimes I'd just go rogue in the field and I'd be like, no, we're following this because this is so much cooler than what we've set out to do. And, and Girls Next Door did allow us to do that. I mean, what, uh, what, would you, what would you both say about like the even nature of who got like more screen time? Do you feel like there's an obvious like weight, you know, on, on one or? Well, it changes throughout the seasons. Season three was the first season I ever felt involved at all. That was the only season where I felt like I got storylines. Not the only season, I mean, moving forward, but that was the first season I felt like I got any storylines. And coincidentally, that was also the season where Kendra started to pull back a little bit and kind of like protest and not want to participate at certain times. So it's not necessarily that I look at the show and be like, oh my God, this person got so much more time. It's just that I feel like the production made an effort to put somebody on more. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it, that's interesting, you know, that that point of view too. Um, and, you know, from my recollection, I don't recall exactly, I know that there wasn't like a mandate. I also know Kendra wasn't coming to the table ever with any ideas or any storylines. Like Bridget, you were always like, I wanna do this and I wanna do this. And we, I was like, great, this is great. And then Holly, as I know the seasons progressed, you also became so much more involved in that too. And you were just always per- pitching and presenting. And that was so cool, by the way. I loved that about the both of you. It was fun. We loved coming up with the ideas. And especially once I saw that, like, oh, my God, I can travel now as long as the cameras follow me. Like, we were always trying to pitch trips and stuff. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's why the trips all really amped up. And I completely forgot that, like, Hef wasn't at Mardi Gras. Yeah, I mean, starting in season three with the snowboarding episode, we actually got to go on a few trips on our own as long as the cameras followed us. And speaking of that kind of thing, we wanted to ask you, since we had a nine o'clock curfew and there were all these rules and stuff, did you guys as a production ever feel like those rules like hindered the show? Like, was it ever frustrating for you guys? Like, fuck, that would have been really fun if we could have actually stayed out all night or something. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the nine o'clock curfew definitely, you know, made our shoot day very straightforward and we kind of knew when it was going to end, which, you know, I guess from that standpoint was kind of nice. Um, You know, the show really wasn't about you girls, right? After hours, like going out, it always kind of buttoned up into like Holly Goat sleeps in half's bedroom, Bridget and Kendra go to theirs. And it was like, you just had this nice solace of knowing everybody's put to bed and happy and in their home, you know, that's what we presented. Right. Um, And so I don't know if it ever posed many issues to me. It was kind of great because I was like, this is very straightforward. And it was only, you know, the parties or whatever that we knew that we would be out late, but I did with that same, you know, I loved seeing y'all let loose. Oh. Like when when you guys were either on a, a little vacation with the cameras or once it kind of loosened up a little bit towards the end. And I felt like the show really became so much more like yours. Yeah. I remember this, one, and I don't think I was in the field for it, but I remember, um, Holly, it was a birthday party of yours. I think it was the Marie Antoinette party. Mm-hmm. And there was something, I just remember watching the footage and watching the raw footage. I don't know what the edit looks like. I should probably go back and look it up. But you were really annoyed because the movie was long and and you were, and you said to Brian, you know, I remember you talking to Brian, you were like, Hef cannot, like Hef cannot start the movie early because you had your agenda of what you wanted for the party. And there was all of a sudden Hef was kind of, going to maybe do something different. And you were so pissed. And I remember like seeing it in your face, but you couldn't actually be like, you know, yeah. like keep the composure. And you said to Brian, you need to tell half that like, he can't start the movie. And Brian's like, uh, I'm not telling him. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling him about it. Do you remember that? 
Well, yeah, I remember it made it into the episode, like a cute sanitized version. Like we're all smiling, like, Brian, don't tell him this, you know, but it's yeah. because he just could like the movie was long. So he wanted to start it early so that it ended the same time a movie would usually end. But then we wouldn't have had daylight and time to film what we needed to film, which was like, here's your golf cart and here's the guillotine and here's this. And and we had this big elaborate dinner planned and like the butlers even pitched in and like I'll put on white wigs, which was their idea. And it was really cute. And that would have like, if Hef would have started the movie a half hour early, would have barely had time to capture any of that. And this is like the first time I'm ever getting a plot line or anything. Yeah, that was tough. I think, you know, from a production standpoint is some of the rigid rules around like his schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, very interesting you know when you're saying oh yeah soup comes up at this time movie starts at this time dinner's at this time car you know man night all the stuff but on our end that was tricky it's back to school time and even though i love HelloFresh year round some of you might find it especially beneficial this time of year because you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy fun and affordable that's why it's america's number one meal kit I think we can all agree that home-cooked meals are so much better for us, but you don't always have time to pull it off. But with HelloFresh handling all the meal planning, shopping, and most of the prep, it's easier than ever to get dinner on the table quick and painless. No more endless recipe searching or spending money on a whole jar of spices for only a pinch. With HelloFresh, everything you need to make delicious meals comes right to your door, pre-proportioned and fresh. Plus, they include step-by-step -step recipe cards to make your cooking so simple. There's always new flavors to explore with an ever-changing menu of 50 recipes to choose from every week. Just pick your meals and your delivery date. It's really that simple. One of the things I love most about HelloFresh is just the ability to like take a risk on trying new recipes. I don't have to buy whole bottles of spices or weird ingredients that I might not ever use or really like. But with HelloFresh, I get just exactly what I need for that recipe and I can try new things. It kind of takes some of that stress out of it for me. Plus, I often get stuck in the same routine. So having new recipes and new things to try makes both Nick and I happy. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh. And with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands and now our listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with us. For free breakfast for life, go to HelloFresh.com slash free next level. One free breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life just by going to HelloFresh.com slash free next level. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And Hef would do this thing too, where he would kind of like swoop in and ruin things. Like Bridget and I would vent to each other all the time about this. It's like when we got the opportunity to contribute or plan something, he'd approve it and be cool with it until like, like say you picked a theme for a party until the last minute. He's like, I don't like this, change it. And he'd like fuck up your whole thing, which was like, what happened with my birthday party is I'd planned, okay, this is what we're going to film while we still have the daylight because it was in December. And then the movie starts and blah, blah, blah. And last minute, he's like, oh, this is a really long movie. We need to start a half hour early. And I'm like, thanks a lot, bro. Yeah, like, yeah, like maybe it was it was like a control thing. So we did a lot of traveling on the show. And I'm curious, were there like rivalries? Were people like fighting over getting to go? Uh, um, I do think, you know, it became kind of a seniority thing. Um, I know, you know, towards... Toward, in the later seasons, I, I know that there were some producers that like didn't want to travel for one reason or another. So I was always willing to travel and I loved going on the trips. And I know as, as my seniority rose and especially in season four, when I had a lot more control over the field and, and was kind of that person, you know, running Lauren was there as well. And I know Mora, but, um, I kind of took on that role of like, I was like a crew, I'd fly with half and that kind of became naturally what happened. And I, I know that like, it wasn't Kevin who was making those decisions. 
uh, necessarily. It was more of like our production team and like us against the, you know, amongst the producers. Um, you know, some producers had personal lives back in LA that they didn't want to leave or, you know, they wanted to stay local. So they take the mansion stuff. Um, I was always like, put me on the plane. <laughs> yeah. I'm in. So there were so many like friends and side characters and recurring characters we had on the show. Did you have any favorites that you were always excited? Like, oh, this playmate's going to be in town or, oh, this person's coming with us who are like extra fun. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, I loved Laura Croft. Uh, <laughs> Amber, like just funny, crazy, like wild ones. Mm-hmm. They would just Amber Campisi. Mm-hmm. Um, Angel. I remember like when a- like meeting Angel for the first time and she was like just such this like sweet little innocent like girl. Do you remember that whole th- whole time meeting her like for the first oh, time, Holly? Like, like it was yesterday. I remember my stupid Ed Hardy hat I was wearing and <laughs> she was a cheerleader in high school and so would I. And we were sitting out. I just met her. The limo had dropped her off and we were sitting on the stoop in front of the guest house and we were talking about cheerleading and she goes, did they have really long skirts back in your day? I'm like, I'm not that old. <laughs> she was like, oh, you're so old. That, yeah, because she was so young. What was she, like 19, 18? 18 when we met 18. her. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I still remember that. So Angel was great. And she was still Angel. Like, yeah. she was still who she is, but she was just, you know, a little, a younger version. Um, let's see who else. I really like, do you remember Crystal McCahill? Yeah, she was great. Loved her. She was so great just from a production standpoint too. She was so good with the flow. Were there girls that you were like, oh, this girl just doesn't pop. Like she's nice and everything, but she doesn't work for the show. Or any that weren't nice that you were like, fuck, we have to work at this one again. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, <gasps> definitely. Okay. Just <laughs> tell us after. We want to know record we'll talk okay yes can you give us without naming names or making it obvious who it is can you say why you didn't like working with those people or what was difficult about it um I think uh, well one in particular was really stuck up and really snooty and felt that she was um I don't know like better like almost like too good to be kind of on the show or something I, I don't know it was this air and it was a struggle to just get content with this person. And then, I mean, look, yeah, not to talk shit, but like season six was a struggle. (laughs) Oh, we're going to get into that (laughs) for sure. Yeah. I mean, I told you, I feel like I may have blocked a lot of it out, to be honest. I mean, the, the memories are really, really unclear because I remember it being just, it was not you girls and they were not seasoned and it was, you know, it felt really fake. Do you remember any events that you were present for filming that were uncomfortable to witness or like, oh shit, we shouldn't really be getting this on camera? What was it? Not necessarily on camera, but I could tell you about, um, you know, we had an issue with one of the playmates staying at the bunny house and one of our crew. I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to name names, but I remember that. It was like a huge thing because I was shocked. And by the way, I can't be certain that it didn't happen prior to this, but if it was, it was kept very under wraps, right? Like, no, I, we did not have issues like that on the show. Yeah. Like where there were, you know, people getting fired because they were hooking up with playmates or whatever. But then this one happened and I remember it was like, Oh man. And it was a lot of drama on our crew because it was like happening while we were filming, you know, some big thing and we had to fire him like in the moment. And it was like this. Yeah. Lots of drama. That was a hectic time period too, for production, just all the stuff we were filming and things like that. Yes. And cramming everything in before everybody left. Yeah. I have another question too, just about that. But do you think like with Kevin dying and obviously like with Hef not being around either, this, it makes for such kind of like a nice, even slate for this podcast too. Like just to kind of be clean and like, you know, nobody has to like worry about 
anything. Is that, do you feel like that? Well, if Kevin were still alive, because he was so protective about being the ultimate storyteller. And I think that's why my book pissed him off so much. Mm -hmm. Like if he were alive right now, he would be doing everything in his power to make our lives a living hell. Like he would not stand for this. He would, he would do whatever he could. Like it would be a constant nightmare. I'd constantly have to be looking over my shoulder. Like it would not be cute. Yeah. Yeah. He would ignore it. Hef wouldn't give a shit. I mean, he wouldn't like it, but he would ignore it. He wouldn't give it the time of day. Kevin would make it his life's mission to bury us. Did you notice the dynamic between the three of us girls changing season to season? Yeah, I did. You know, I was always, there were some genuine moments. I wish I could recall exactly what there were, but I remember having these feelings where there would be an event or there would be a story that was transpiring or there would be moments where it was genuinely like a connection between the three of you. And I know that as we progress, it was such a struggle with Kendra because, you know, she, you know, she's tough. She was so tough. And I know a lot of my energy went there. You know, it's easy enough to say, oh, well, fine. Like, just let her like fail and just kind of let her flounder. And if she's going to sleep in and she has a call time, well, then whatever. But we couldn't do that. You know, we couldn't do that for so many reasons, you know, and, and it was annoying and it was frustrating. And I know, you know, I felt a lot of the time I was like, oh, this is motherhood before I'm even a mom. You know, it's like, come on, get your ass up. Like, you have a duty. This is a job. I remember having that conversation with her a lot. I don't think I ever had it with either of you because that wasn't an issue. But I was like, you know, I'm working too. Like, I'd rather, be, you know, I might want to, you know, be with my dad on his birthday. But guess what? I have to miss it because I'm working, you know, like. Those were realities that never crossed her mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like we were just there for our own good. And I think that was, that was really tough, yeah. you know, those dynamics. And I think just amongst the three of you and the relationships, it's it, the longer we went on and the worse that got, that was so frustrating for the both of you because you did show up and you were on time. Yeah, that was tough. How was working with Hef for you? You know, Hef liked me. Hef, Hef respected me as a producer. Um, like you. Oh, thanks. You know, Hef, it's, it's funny because I was also the producer that like Lauren or like Mora would be like, hey, go talk to Hef. <laughs> like with a bad news or like something that was shitty or something that was maybe going to piss him off. Like they would send me in. And I had no issue with it. I felt... I felt I was, I knew how to handle him. Yeah. Um, I felt he also knew my name. And I don't know how many producers' names he actually knew. He'd be like, get the producer, get the producer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do remember as time went on, and, and I just saw this just kind of in his, you know, old older age and, and some of the decline, which was interesting, the things that would just annoy him or frustrate him. Um, you know, because he was deaf in one ear and, or couldn't hear really well. And I remember that was really, really a challenge. And if a producer was talking to him and didn't know that and he didn't hear, he would get pissed. Yeah. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He would do things with me, which when he would do it with me, I don't know if it was really him not hearing because it was always very convenient when... I was asking for something or something he telling him something he didn't want to hear. All of a sudden he had to ask me three times, like what, what? So then I'm feeling stupider and stupider because it already sucks to have to say it once to the point where you like back down. So it was a lot. Yeah. And then there were some things I, I know. Um, and I would say that this was a great training for me again, the girls next door being that first show that really like pushed me through the different positions and set me on my career path beyond Hef didn't like to wait. Hef wanted things to move fast. Mm -hmm. And you guys know with production, it's not always fast. Like sometimes we have a tech issue. Sometimes like we're waiting on something, you know, and, and he was really particular about that. And so I just remember it was, it was good training for me because it helped me really be thinking 20 steps ahead. Yeah. 
you know, because you didn't want to piss Hef off. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that was not fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with Barbie Benton? Did you get to know her at all? Um, Barbie was fun. I really liked Barbie. I remember when we all went to Aspen. Yes. And her funky spaceship house. Yeah, that was so fun. So fun. Yeah, so in the capacity that, you know, I got to know her, it was really in some of the preps and the plannings of of that trip in particular. Um, And then if I recall, um, I think she made an appearance in season six, too. Her spaceship house. Do you remember me begging, begging to leave with you guys? Like, I just had the ickiest feeling and I did not want to spend the night there oh my gosh I do I totally do I remember you telling me that you got a bad feeling there but I don't remember it being that extreme I didn't know you were trying to leave the house oh no like I was yeah, begging. She- I was begging please I just want to stay at the hotel I'll come back first thing in the morning with you guys and pretend I spent the night like I don't want to spend yeah. the night here do, do you remember what I said to you like do, was I like trying to make it work no, you were like, there's no way we can do that. Like, you have to stay here. Have snuck yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's I totally remember that. I remember you being so uncomfortable. And you were like, the vibe, the vibe. Like, it was just, like, not comforting. Yeah. Do you think it was, like, an energy thing or a ghost thing or just a people thing? It was an energy thing of some sort. I don't know what it, where it was coming from. I don't recall thinking paranormal at that time at all, but... Uh, I don't know. I just got like a really bad icky vibe. That I needed to get out of that house. Yep. I, I remember that. And I've never really felt like that before. And I've never, I don't feel like I've ever really been that insistent that I w- didn't want to do something before either on the show. But I was just like, I have to get out of here. Like I was so sad that I had to stay there and I felt so envious that they got to go back to a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Was it difficult to film the House Bunny episode since there was like a, another film crew there and doing all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I remember that t- that time being tough just because of the restrictions. And also, I think what we tried to do was do a lot of interviews during that time because it kept us contained in either the game room or in the... Um, Playmate House? Is that what it was called? What was the little guest house? Oh, the guest house? What are we, was that the name? The guest house? Guest house yeah. Yeah, in the, in the guest house um, where we would do our interviews because we really, we couldn't do much. They, they took over. Yeah, I was wondering, were you guys like demoted since it was a big movie there? Did you feel like, oh, we got bumped down a notch? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I just remembered something. You asked if there was an something that was weird to film or awkward or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember when Brett Ratner came for the Guitar Hero shoot? No, because that's season six. Oh, was that? That was awful. That was so uncomfortable. I have a question for you that you may or may not remember or know about, but midway through season five, (laughs) Kevin took me aside and said, Look, Kendra's going to leave. I don't I don't remember if he told me she was going to leave or that she just wasn't participating and wasn't doing her scenes. And he's like, we need to find somebody to replace her on the show. Not meaning as a girlfriend, but like a playmate who could live at the playmate house or like a friend who could be in the guest house or maybe somebody who could be my assistant at the studio or something. He wanted to find like a third girl to replace her. So he's like, round up as many girls that you think would be good. We'll have them stay at the play at the playmate house. And like, we'll see who's good. We'll see who pops. Do you remember that at all? Were you clued in on that? And you know what? It, it sounds like vaguely familiar. I feel like there was a time and I don't, I guess it probably was season five. That makes sense because that's ultimately, you know, when everyone left, but I knew that like she was so withdrawn and she was not, and she was just so difficult and not wanting to participate in the storylines and not wanting to do anything. And everything was a pushback and it becomes really hard. You know, it's like, if that's every once in a while and a little character beat that you can kind of play as like, Oh yeah, she's just annoyed or frustrated. Like doesn't want to wear the costume, doesn't want to do, but we couldn't even shoot with her. Like she was just that tough. 
So I do remember that that there was like that she's like I'm gonna leave. I, she was threatening that. Yeah. But I don't I don't remember like the replacement piece. Definitely not as a girlfriend, like you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, did, was that around the time though that we started having a lot of friends just kind of around? Yeah, because I feel like there were a lot of girls that were just kind of there that we started having. Yeah, he asked me to pick four people that are candidates and he would kind of watch how they did on the show. And we shot some stuff with them, but then it was never used. And like at the last minute, he got some footage with Kendra because I think she got spooked like, oh, wait, they really are going to replace me and then plug the footage in. Yeah, you know, that is ringing a bell. That's so interesting. Like just the the stuff that we forget. Yeah. But yeah, that is ringing a bell. Tell us about, I know you mentioned uh, Kentucky Derby. One of your favorite memories is the mint jewels, the thousand dollar mint juleps that we got. Um, But are there any other favorite memories between like that or like the New Orleans trip? Love the New Orleans trip. I still, to this day, remember the vampire greeting us and thinking it was so funny. Like, I just loved it. Like, the vampire, and I love, in typical Bridget form, she, like, is all into it. It's all ready. She's telling us. I just, that was great. I actually connected with Lord Chaz, by the way, for another show that I did because we went to New Orleans to shoot. And he was still, like you know, doing his vampire thing. And I reached out to him to see if he was available and it didn't end up working out. But he became one of the people I reached out to as potentially something to do. That is so funny. I remember the beignets and I remember the, you know, just that night and how eventful. Um, Didn't your voice, like, didn't you lose your voice or were you sick or something? I got really sick and I completely lost my voice. I remember that. And I remember uh, you, you were totally powering through. Like, you, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, again, these are all like, I should go and watch these episodes because it would be so fun. Like my memory is, you know, something so special, but then to see the way it's edited. But I do remember you losing your voice and I remember you being such a, like, you were like, I'm, I'm like, you were still fully involved in the shooting. Like you, you weren't like, Oh, I gotta, gotta lay down. Like you weren't checking out. Well, I had wanted to go to New Orleans for so long and I was finally there and doing it. And then I get sick and I was like, no, I mean, I know I had to be, I had to lay down for a little part of it, but I was like, as soon as I could just force myself up, I was going to do it. Just the accessibility, you know, the the life that we got to live, you know, in conjunction with this amazing job we had, you know, that is something I do not take for granted. And I think it's just so incredibly special and such a huge part of my life. You know, I just feel so lucky that not only did I have this super cool job on this really incredible show, it was so fun. I got to do really cool things. And in a lot of ways, it kind of spoiled me because when I ended up leaving, like all the spinoffs and everything and like went and worked for another Prodco and another comp- another show, it was not the same. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a unique experience. Yes. And speaking of season five stuff, uh, like we said, we'll have to have you back on when we actually really get into season five because it's so crazy. But were you privy to any of like the panic on Kevin's end when we all decided to bail at the last minute? Like, what was that like? Oh, my gosh. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was he didn't he didn't know what to do. He thought he could salvage it. I mean, he thought that he could get rope you guys into to stay. I mean, and I'm sure he did. And I don't know what those pitches were to you, but I know that he was like, we can't, they can't leave. They can't. I know that he was upset. He took it personally. You know, I understood it. I had also been talking to you all kind of about the trajectories and everybody, you know, you were spending more time in Vegas, Holly. It's just everybody, I think at that point, had kind of figured out that they wanted a life beyond the mansion. Like it made sense. And 
it had really run its course. Yeah, for sure. And did you guys have to really scramble at the last minute to come up with some kind of ending that looked favorable to have? I know that it was treated very carefully. We had to be really, really careful about, you know, that it wasn't like you guys were leaving him or like, you know, uh, because of any uh, negative feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, it was all... For the way that I think ultimately the way it's portrayed, I, again, I should, wasn't that a two-parter? Well, it was a two-part ending for season five that focused entirely on Kendra. Like it was this big, massive, grateful send-off for Kendra because that was the only one they were prepared for. Like they knew she was going to leave and go do her spin-off, yeah. so they were ready to do that. And then Bridget, they said, was going off to do her Beaches show. But that was tricky, too. And my guess is because E! probably didn't want to advertise a travel channel show. I feel like they didn't quite give it, like, the due that they could have given it. So it was kind That's of right. And then for me, they had me walk downstairs and talk, I'm going to Vegas. I'll be right back. Because Kevin wanted to leave the door open because Kevin wanted me yes. to come back. So he just wanted to leave the door open with that. And that was all it was. And that was the ending the fans got. And I think everybody was really upset and disappointed. And then all of a sudden, the next thing they know, they're being introduced to these new girls. And it was jarring. Yes, agreed. And I, and I, I think Kevin probably just knowing Kevin, right? He probably thought he could, you know, rope you back in there. And that it maybe wasn't like a long-term thing. And because that really was like more of the, the surprise. Also, the other thing that was really deceptive, again, I haven't seen season five since we did commentary for it 15 years yeah. ago. But another thing I remember that was deceptive was they have started dating the twins after we left, but they wove it in and made it look like Hep and the twins started dating like before we left, which was, I feel like, creepy and in my opinion makes Hef look like shit because then he's a cheater but I think in Kevin and Hef's mind it's like they have to do that because Hef has to be the player and Hef never really gets left and Hef always has something cooking you know well I remember that being like a big Hef thing is that he did not want he could not be left like a single man like he had to have somebody there um, and so, yes, I think like having the twins there, even though that wasn't really like the timeline, um, that had to be the case for him and for his, you know, perception and the way that he's portrayed and, and all of that. Um, and, you know, obviously Kevin backed that up. It was a struggle trying to figure out how to tell that story because we knew that Hef wasn't going to allow like the real story. Yeah, not at all. Like it couldn't be mentioned once I started seeing somebody else that couldn't yeah. be mentioned. And it just, I mean, but when I say like, I can't be honest, or I can't tell the story. I never really felt like I had the option at all. Like nobody gave exactly. me the option to say why I was leaving or anything. It was just like, I broke it off with Hef. And then I just kind of moved down to room five and part-time stuck around just to finish what I needed to finish. And I felt like it was just like, okay, you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this. Like it was never again, like, okay, Holly, what, what's on your mind? You know? No, 100%. I mean, you, it was a forced position, right? Like yeah. they, they were never going to give you the opportunity to actually say like what your side of the story was. And after season five ended, you did pre-production on Kendra season one, and then you went straight to Girls Next Door season six. Is that how it went? Yes. So I did. So when I was like actually thinking about it, I was like, oh my gosh, I did do Girls Next Door season six. And that was really a challenge for so many reasons. Oh, totally. First of all, I mean, well, Crystal and the twins, you know, they didn't really have to earn much. They were kind of like walking into this situation. Mm -hmm. But the reality was they were not Holly, Bridget, and Kendra. You know, they weren't. Um, and ultimately, that's why the show didn't work. There also was, you know, to me, it wasn't genuine. It felt forced. You know, Crystal, you know, Crystal never really had an opinion of her own it was really, really tough to work with her because she was fine just being told what to say. But that doesn't make for a good character on a show. 
know, it's like you, you all earned your position on that show. And of course, like it didn't start out the way that it ended with you guys, but you grew into that and you really took shape of who you were on and off camera. And that's also why I worked is the more that time went on, the more vulnerable you got, the more comfortable you were with really talking about your feelings and the way that you felt about certain things and doing and participating, you know, with them, they just, they were lucky. Like they just got to like kind of fall into this role and they had a show. My recollection too is a lot of stretch for content. Like they didn't have real shit going on. Did like, you notice at the time you were filming it that a lot of the plot line ideas were stuff that we used to pitch to Kevin? And then he was like, I know they can do yeah. the roller disco party that I never let the girls do. Or I know Holly always wanted to do camping in the backyard, you know? It felt, yeah, yes. And I don't think necessarily did I put that together, but it did feel like it, you know, it felt very surface, very like travel loggy, but like at the mansion. It wasn't deep. It wasn't exciting. Personally, I mean, aside from like the twins being like, you know, hot, young, crazy twins that were like, that would do anything. It, it didn't feel rooted in like the integrity of the show and like what the show was and like what made it so special. Were you bummed that you got stuck on that show instead of traveling the world on Bridget's beaches? <laughs> oh my gosh. Bridget, do you remember talking about, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm dying to be on your show. And you're like, I want you to be on the show so much. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And, and Kevin, again, like that was a carrot that Kevin dangled because I, I told him, I was like, I do not want to work on, you know, girls next door season six. I want to go to Bridget's beaches. Um, and at one point I felt like the job was mine and then it wasn't. I remember yeah. that I was telling Holly before we were talking today, I said, I remember like begging for Becca to be on the show. Like I wanted her to be on it so bad. And I remember other producers coming up to me wanting to be on the show. And it wasn't like I had a say in it or anything, but, but I just remember going back and forth and I was so disappointed when Kevin changed everything. Yeah, it, I feel like everything changed and I I don't really remember why. I feel like there may have been like something just with me knowing the lay of the land at the mansion and me knowing the way that kind of everything worked. And so it may have just been easier in his mind than to kind of start over. I was not happy. With, I wasn't with either. Yeah. And then did Kevin share with you his concern? Because I wasn't speaking with Kevin during the filming of Girls Next Door season six, but he did confide in me about it afterward. In the moment, did he confide in you how concerned he was about the casting of the girls and how he knew it was going to be a disaster kind of from day one? Oh, well, you mean with Crystal and the twins? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways... I felt like, you know, it was, it was just kind of like the desperate desperation move. Like it, in truth, it would have been better, you know, to end on the high note of a season five with everyone, all of our, our girls that we have grown to love over the course of these five seasons. And we have seen growth and done like a beautiful kind of like recount of all of that. Even like an intimate moment with half. And I know that it was like really weird at that time, just because everything was kind of going in all these different directions. But all that to say, you know, we could have just done that and just had like this moment where, yeah, of course, like half's not going to stay single for the rest of his life and just done like a little beat or a little moment at the end of that episode as opposed to it being a whole new season. Yeah. I think the problem was E ordered season five and season six together. Yeah. So they already had these episodes that were like bought and paid for and had to do something. Yeah. Yes. I do remember Kevin not feeling positive about it. Yeah. And none of us did. like that. That was the truth. Like none of us did. Like we all kind of saw the writing on the wall. 
And it, and it did. It felt like such a, it felt like such a desperate move. It was very unfortunate, you know, that it happened. Like that's such a good point. It is. That is such a good point. Um, and do you think like in Hef's mind though, that he really thought that y'all would be there forever? I think yeah. he thought I was going to be like, that was the plan. Well, Kevin told me, but he told me after the fact, like I was not clued in on this plan, but the plan was Bridget was going to go do beaches. Kendra was going to do her spinoff and girls next door. Season six was supposed to be about me and Hef and whoever the girls at the studio were. Nobody include me on this, on my plan. They're just planning my whole life as if I'm like a 12 year old child with no say in it. Ugh. And that's why he was so fucking pissed at me when I left and tried to like, you know, ruin me for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I mean, look, we know something about Kevin, like, you know, when he felt betrayed, even if it was not rational thought, you know, he took it very personally. I mean, that happened with me and Kevin ultimately when I left Kendra's show. Yeah, I'll ask you about that as much as you're willing to share for sure. Before we get too much into Kendra's show, can I go back to season six a little bit? Yeah. Did you work on the roller disco party with Barbie Benton in season six? On the tennis courts? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this scene, but I rewatched that episode recently. And there's a scene where Barbie takes Hef aside and asks him if he's okay. And he's like, oh, you know, like he always says, you know, every phase of his life is the best one, whatever he's in right now. And you can just see it in Barbie's face. Like she knows he's full of shit. She knows he's struggling and she is so, she looks so heartbroken. Did you catch that? Or am I the only one? Oh, 100% when you just said it I totally recalled the memory too and I actually I was I was there for that and I remember saying to Hef because I did have this relationship with him you know is there anything more that you want to share because the truth is I was always trying to be like okay is audience gonna call bullshit is this real like does this feel fake I mean we've had those conversations throughout our years working together I was like but is that really how you feel, Holly or, or Bridget or, or Kendra? Like, I'm sensing a little reserve or, or whatever. And I remember saying to him, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to share, you know, about how you do miss Holly. I mean, he did. He clearly did. And he knew it. But it's just so sad that even that wall, like that vulnerability, like he wasn't going to let anybody see it. Yeah, he could never admit it. But how special would that have been? Because see, I, I love those moments where you, you kind of break the norm. Like how cool would that have been all of a sudden for Hef to like have this moment of vulnerability where the guard comes down and he's like really tapping into a true emotion. Did you notice after we left and the gr new girls moved in, because Bridget and I have talked about this on the podcast before, how even though Hef is very set in his routine, he kind of goes through phases from decade to decade. And whatever woman has the most influence in his life at the time kind of sets a tone a little bit at the mansion. Did you notice the mansion itself and the social life feeling different once the changeover happened? Oh, I felt like the wind blew out of that place like it just it didn't feel full it didn't feel light it didn't feel special it didn't feel I mean it started quite frankly it started to feel more depressing it was so evident too I think even amongst our crew like because it was such a struggle it was so hard like just filming with that group and like yeah how cool like we get to be on a tv show like I they were all so excited but they weren't put in and work, you know, they just wanted to be told what to do. And it's like, we're not, you know, this, that's not, yeah. And, and the mansion light like did dim, you know. Did you work on Kendra's wedding episode? I did. That was crazy. Also a lot of fun, ton of moving parts. We had like 10 crews or something that day. Like it was insane. We had a lot going on and, uh Especially challenging because um, Michael Jackson's funeral. Do you guys remember that? 
Yeah, yeah the well, there were helicopters overhead. And for those at home that don't know, like if you're filming anything like a confessional interview and a helicopter goes overhead, you have to stop talking because it ruins the sound and wait for the helicopter, wait for the plane, whatever. And we're outside in the front lawn trying to film Kendra's wedding. And there's just helicopters like crazy because Michael Jackson's funeral was happening in L.A. on that same day. And you just couldn't get a clear sky. <laughs> no, it was so challenging. In the audio that day just sucked. And I mean, you know, what can you do in that situation? But yeah. yeah. Last season six question. So Bridget is asked to throw this amazing pickles and ice cream baby shower for Kendra in Mary O'Connor's backyard. And everything's going great. It's visual. It's fun, blah, blah, blah. But because this is being filmed for not Kendra's show, oddly enough, but Girls Next Door season six, the Crystal and the twins are invited and they show up and everything seems fine. Like everybody's having a good time. And then all of a sudden, I want to get your memory on this because my memory is kind of shady on it. They're missing. And at first, honestly, not to be a bitch, but nobody even notices because they just weren't like everybody else knew each other from before, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden there's this drama. Do you remember how the drama went down? I feel like they were like, why are we even here? But it was like their show. But I mean, I, everyone was thinking it because it was like, why are they even here? It didn't make sense. It was a forced situation. They weren't friends with Kendra. They weren't, you know. So again, this was one of those moments that was like a manufactured moment to try and get the old and the new together all in one place. You know, I remember going into this being like, oh, shit. Like, this is... Yeah, I get it. I understand it. Like from that standpoint, how cool like to see the old girls and the new girls. But this was also a real moment for Kendra with the baby shower. And it didn't really make sense. And to be on Girls Next Door season six also didn't really make sense because those girls had no connection. And I do remember they, I remember, I could, couldn't tell you exactly what was said, but I do remember that they did, they did not want to be there. But I was like, but it's your show. Like, this, this is tricky. But that that was the vibe. My memory's cloudy on it, but I remember the three girls went missing. They went off to a bedroom, locked themselves in, not literally, but like, you know, locked, they just like sequestered yeah. themselves in there. And then all of a sudden, Mary comes out. And I think Mary was trying to get Bridget to be the babysitter and be like, oh, make the girls feel welcome. And you're like, well, actually, I'm like running these games right now or whatever you are doing. And a baby my, shower. <laughs> yeah, like, obviously, I'm not in their heads. I don't know. But my feeling at the time was they thought we're the new stars of Girls Next Door. Why is all this activity not about us? And we, everybody's just like, what the fuck? And then after that happened, I remember Perez Hilton wrote about it. I don't know who told him, probably somebody from Kendra's camp. But Perez Hilton wrote about it, and he was kind of snarky about it toward the new girls because it was, I mean, he basically knew what was going on and knew, like, the motivation and stuff. And then Kevin told me Hef was so upset about it, and he was like, what am I going to say about this on Twitter? Because Hef couldn't handle it that the fans were still connected to us and didn't automatically jump to the new girls. Well, of course. I mean, and, yeah. <sighs> Sorry. Like, that's just the way it was. I mean, that was, that was tough. I remember that being a shitty day. And it was unfortunate because it was also like such this exciting day. And I remember there being so much drama unnecessarily. Yeah. And then, and then on top of it, it wasn't the kind of show where we could show it. So it yeah, wasn't like, like lean into the reality of the situation. We had to actually make it feel like everyone was happy and everyone was getting along. And I, Bridget, I remember, I don't know exactly what it was, but I remember a moment that we had, that you and I had. Because you were like pissed or something at that, right? Like, did you want to, what was the, I forget. They, Molly but, told us what happened. Yeah, that oh. uh, she said that there was a scene where it's on camera, but they don't obviously use it. But she saw it in the edit where you pull me aside and you're like, is there any way that you can just like 
uh, try and include them more or go yeah. talk to them or like, you know, do something to like make them feel better. And I'm in the middle of like running this baby shower with like 50 people on camera and stuff. And I'm like, no. And you're like, you can't even do it just for the show. And I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't. No, I mean, no, I, yeah, I remember that. And I also remember getting heat from Mary because yeah, Mary, Mary too. and I remember I did too, because she was like, you have to like this, this can't be like this because at the end of the day, you know, she was loyal to Hex and like, she had to make, she had to hold up that person, you know, that whole perception that everything was good. And she, you know, saw that it wasn't. And so it was like, fix it. Yeah, she came up to me too, and she was like, "You need to make these girls feel more included. You need to give them something to do." And I'm like, oh, "So I would tell them, oh, do you want to set out these bottles or like move those chairs or whatever?" And then they'd just be like, eh, eh. "She's like telling us what to do," and eh, and like all snotty and stuff. And I'm just like, "I'm not talking to them. I'm not talking. No. To them. They don't even need to be here. Like, why are they here?" Yeah. I remember. So I don't remember what came first chronologically, the Holly's World pilot or Kendra season two, but I'm going to ask you about the pilot first. I had yeah. so much fun working on that pilot with you. And for those that don't know, when a network orders a pilot, it's a mock-up episode uh, that they ended up airing of a show, but it's like an audition tape. It's like showing the network what this could be. So do you remember when we went in to create my pilot, were there certain things you guys knew you had to get in order to make the network want it? And what were those things? Yeah. I mean, I remember it being so much just about like, it was the cast of characters, right? Like you were the leading lady, you were starting your new life. It was like embarking, but it really was intended to feel very separate from girls next door. Mm -hmm. And I remember that being a big part of it is that this was not just like, a girl's next door. Like you were in this whole new world, Holly's world. Um, you had a new home. You were in Vegas. We had that as a backdrop. I remember Vegas was important to be a character on the show very much. Um, and then, you know, again, so much about your cast of characters and something that was so fun about Holly's world was your group. Like, oh my God, Josh so and Angel and Laura, like, wild. Like, it was so fun. I look back on that time of my life, like, Josh and I talk about it all the time. I'm like, we had so much fun. Like, I don't think anybody in the world has, like, had as much fun as me during that era. Like, we didn't rest for a minute. Like, we oh. made the most out of everything. And I don't know if you remember, but like the concept for the pilot and the plot line for the pilot isn't what we ended up making the show about. Do you remember that original concept? I do. I do. Will you talk a little bit about it though? Cause it was so different. Yeah. It was funny. Cause I was like, I knew what the show was. I was like, well, I'm doing this show on the strip. And I was like, okay, it's going to be just about me and my friends and what we're doing and how we're establishing ourselves. And like, just like the world yeah. of like doing a show on the strip and Lisa Berger, one of the network executives at E was always so good about finding like the heart and like the, what is this really about, about each show, even though the E shows were very like light and silly, she wanted that deeper thing there. She's like, well, what is this really about? And when we were pitching the show, she was like, well, you know, we do not want to do a show about Vegas. We always get a pilot about Vegas every single yeah season and it always sucks we don't really want to do a vegas show but if you're really going to try this like i need to know like why are you in vegas why are you in vegas and i was telling kevin i'm like because i like it here because it's fun because i want to be in a burlesque show like i like the obvious stuff but then one day out of the blue like i got this idea that like when i'm older i want to be the mayor of las vegas like after my kids are grown yes. that's going to be like my old lady job and I want to learn how to be like the mayor of Las Vegas. And it was, I wasn't thinking about it for a show. I was just like, kind of like mind vomiting text messages to Kevin. And I was like, yeah. I decided I want to be the mayor of Las Vegas. So he took that to, back to Lisa and Lisa's like, aha, we have something here. So the pilot was all about like yeah. me trying to like change the way traffic is done. 
traffic construction is done in Vegas because it's still to this day a mess. Yeah. Like the orange cone yeah. is our state flower. And so that was the whole thing is I like went around town and like petitioned all these like random like celebrities and show people. And then I went yeah. to Oscar Goodman, who was the mayor of Vegas at the time. And like we were doing stuff together. And my whole concept for it, once we kind of got on that track, was it was going to be this kind of like legally blonde type thing where this like silly blonde girl goes in and learns how to run a city. And that's not what we ended up doing. We ended up like reverting back to my original idea. But I just think yes. it's funny that that was like the original idea that didn't happen. I totally remember that. It was like Holly cuts through the red tape and like gets yeah. stuff done. And it was. I, we shot so much of that with like city representatives and the mayor. I remember shooting with the mayor. Yeah. There were, yeah. Is he still the mayor? No, his wife is. But this is going to be her last term. They're having a new election coming up soon. You still have your house there? I'm in it right now. So the next thing you worked on was Kendra season two. Tell me what it's like for a California girl to get plopped into Indiana in the middle of winter and what that was like. That was such an incredibly tough season. Um, we were dealing, you know, first of all, yeah, Indianapolis in the dead of winter is so cold and so depressing and hard to get around. And it, so it was challenging from a logistics standpoint. Um, but that was really the season where Kendra just like was really, really tough. Like she, she started to, you know, season one was, I think like fresh for her because she was like, I'm free. And now, you know, she's getting married and there was all this new stuff. What we just kind of talked about, you know, we were like never lost for content. There was always things going on. She was, you know, kind of at a peak in terms of even, you know, coming out of girls next door, people cared about her, people wanted her, all that. Season two in Indy was very different. You know, she, um, she was, she was just, she was really stressed. She was really hard to work with. Um, she was really, you know, like controlling. We were working our butts off to try and get this show done. And everything was just really, really difficult, you know, in conjunction with the weather and all that. Um, you know, then like with the birth of Hank and stuff like that, you know, we were on, you know, 24 hour call waiting for that. Um, so even that with, you know, just like being, you know, you know, jump out of bed and being ready, like in the dead of winter, you know, all of that. We spent holidays away from our family. We spent, I mean, it was, it was hard. It was really yeah. hard. I begged Kevin so much to have you on my show. And at first he refused. He was like, no, Becca's a California girl. She's never leaving town again. It's miserable in Indiana. And you know what? She's a Lakers fan. <laughs> she, he said that like, she can't go to Vegas. She's a Lakers fan. So that was kind of like my delay with having you on the show. Did you film in Miami during the Super Bowl that year? Yes, we did. How was that? Yeah. It, that was great. I mean, so I think, you know, look, I am a football fan. I'm a sports fan. So I loved that element of it. I thought like that was really fun. And that kind of offered up something special and unique and just kind of, you know, again, like that VIP uh, access and um, just kind of getting to see the cool things. You know, it was neat that like Hank was a football player and we got to go to games and, you know, we did, um, you know, we did a lot of stuff relative to the NFL, which I, I always was really like shocked about that we did have access to, you know, the NFL and that they allowed that to happen. Yeah. And, you know, fun little like tidbit, because this is before the days. I don't know what the rules are so much now, but like we could actually have like NFL logos and stuff in our shots. Yeah. Like, and yeah. I remember it, even on Girls Next Door, we got to do so much stuff with Star Wars because Kevin had done a documentary for yeah. Lucasfilm. And like you could never do that today because Disney owns it. But we have so much like clips from Star Wars. And like I love that in Girls Next Door. Yeah, I felt like we got away with so much just like, you know, having NFL logos and mm -hmm. whatever. But yeah, so Indy, Indy was challenging. 
Um, and then, you know, I mean, I, once, once the baby was born, you know, Kendra just really struggled, you know, Hank was deep in the season and like being a, you know, a wife of a, of an athlete, a professional athlete, I definitely comes with its challenges, you know, I mean, um, and I'm not taking away from that, but, you know, she struggled. She, she put a lot of pressure on herself, you know, uh, as far as the baby with like breastfeeding and with, you know, taking care of the baby all by themselves and not having a nanny and not getting help. And I think that she needed help. Like she, you know, had, she had a lot of postpartum stuff that she was like not dealing with and it affected the, you know, the content and infected her and affected all of us. And it was, I mean, it sucks. It was really sad. And I would, you know, I remember talking to her about it. Um, but at that point also, she was like growing distant from her family and like, she wasn't, I don't remember exactly like what those timelines were, but I remember there were, she was like removing herself from like a lot of the people that I think did care about her. Including yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually we would fall under that too. Yeah. And before you came to Holly's World season two, I think, did you do Bridget's pilot before that? What was the timeline? Was that before Holly? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was before because, yeah, it was before season two because <clears throat> Holly, you marked my end to Prometheus when I wrapped your show. Really? Because I thought you left after something happened on Kendra's show. So I left Kendra's show. And then came to you. So I wrapped up Kendra and then did Bridget's pilot and then Holly's World. Um, and Holly's World was my last Kevin show. Yeah, so so Kendra and my relationship did sour after I left her show. And I'm comfortable talking about it. Ultimately, I was just done with the shit. Yeah. Like I felt that... You know, I I look, I knew her for so many years. She knew me. You know, she had no reason not to trust me. We had a great working relationship until we didn't. And I think, you know, with her postpartum, and I think that she 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 was really difficult. And I was out there working my ass off, you know, away from my family, which of course is the career path I chose, and I took it very seriously. And you know that I'm very professional and care a lot about the work that I do, but I think it got to the point where she was just rude and not nice and not doing anything. And I would call Kevin and I'd be like, Hey, you have to step up and like, tell her like, she has a job yeah. Like she isn't, doesn't want to hear it from me. And he wouldn't, he like, wouldn't do it. And it was, and I was like, fuck this. This is not okay. Yeah. And I said to him, I was like, this is not okay. Like, I'm not saying I don't want to work, you know, for you anymore, but this relationship, like I am not getting anywhere with her. Anymore. Yeah. I'm not. And it wasn't good for the show and it wasn't good for me and for, for anyone. Didn't something weird happen where like Kendra did something on camera and Kevin saw the footage. And even though the footage showed that you were in the right, he still sided with Kendra. Yes. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm like, gosh, what was it? But that's exactly what happened. We got, and it's on camera. It's crazy how much of an enabler he became in the spinoff years. So I left after, you know, like after our show wrapped, I left, like went off to do my own thing. Kevin and I reconnected and he was like still mad at me, like holding a grudge because I had like left to go pursue my own life, just like you guys did. And you guys left the mansion, yeah. right? Like you were pursuing. And by the way, like my world opened up because after like I left your show and I left Prometheus, I worked for Prometheus for 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, essentially. Um, I met my husband immediately on the next show. Like, I mean, it's it's just so interesting, like what life brings, right? Like, okay, new chapter. And clearly I was ready. But back to more fun times. I finally yeah. got you to come out and work on my show for season two. And our friend Vic was on the show and we had the most yes. fun 
crew. What was it like for you filming a show in Vegas? Like, what are the difficulties of like having to like film in casinos and do all that? I mean, let's face it. I think my girls next door days really like primed and prepped me for that. Right. Um, yeah. It was great. It's like, by the time we filmed in, in Vegas, you know, for the full series for your show, we had so many contacts in Vegas. We had it probably easier than most. And then on a production standpoint, you know, obviously he helped out a lot. But then we also had maintained relationships too, like at the bars and like at the restaurants. And so like people were constantly just even inviting our crew to come and eat or like, you know, like that's special. Like, yeah, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And Again, I remember, I remember feeling so happy working on your show because it was fun. Like we were always having fun. We were always laughing. Uh, you know, it was never a dull moment. There was like entertainment between like Josh and like Laura, like always just being like wacky and fun and like uh -huh. just good vibes, really good vibes. Totally. That's like one of my favorite times in my life. hundred percent. The only thing I really remember being difficult about that season was we decided to do confessionals green screen. And I always have these little flyaway hairs and I was just like, just pull it out of my head. Just cause we were trying to like stick my hair down with pomade all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, the green screen, I, uh, to this day, I'm just still not a fan of, I am all about like a natural interview setting. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it always just looks so much better. Did Kevin try to rope you into working on the Lifetime Hef's Runaway Bride special after Crystal left? I did not want anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah. What year was that, by the way? Because he... It had to have been 2011 or 2012. I think it was 2011 because that was the year she was, yeah, 2011. So had we, we had wrapped your show? Yeah, it was right after my show wrapped. And I went and did a thing with a scene with Kendra and Mary for the runaway bride special. And the only, I didn't want to do it. I was like, so ready to completely separate from playboy at that time. But Kevin really, really begged and was like, Oh, this will look really good to lifetime. I could get you a show on lifetime, which is like so stupid. Like that was never going to happen. But like, that's the kind of shit he would pull out of his ass to like, get you to do stuff. Even if there was no intention of that happening. Exactly. I was, supposed to have, I was supposed to have a whole wedding special. Yes. No. Yeah. Didn't you promise you like three shows if you would go on Kendra's show for one scene? Yeah. He was going to, it was some shows that I wanted to produce and then my, a wedding special. Yeah. Yeah. He liked to dangle the carrot for sure. Oh gosh. He, that, he's the king of carrot dangling. So after you left Prometheus, what are some of your favorite things you've worked on since then? Oh, goodness. Well, I definitely am, you know, known for docu-series female skewed. So most of the jobs, you know, that I at least, you know, meet on are in that vein, um, which is awesome. I have done quite a few e-shows over the years, post Girls Next Door and uh, spinoffs, which is um, which is great because I, I have managed to stay in that family. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, it is always a talking point. Every meeting that I ever have about any job, they always want to know what it was like working on Girls Next Door. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And I always smile when I recall it. And um, it's, it, it's, it is a genuinely good feeling I get when I just think about those days. I mean, it's, it's just true, you know, for, for as challenging as it was and, you know, for difficult as it was and all of those things, like that's production, right? Mm -hmm. That's, life. but so special. So that, that is me that I talk about it virtually in every meeting. Um, but I would say I would, what I wish I could do more of, I love baking and cooking shows. And I've done two series and it was so fun. And I just wish I had more of those. 
And now you're a married mom of three adorable kids. Yes, I am. And we moved to, you know, we still have a house in LA, which is great because we go back and forth. But um, during COVID, we ended up moving to Dallas um, and we love it here. Life is just a little more simple and a little more quiet. We have land and we live on a lake. We have chickens. And it's so funny because I'm an LA girl, you know, born and raised and, um, I, I miss LA, which is why we are, you know, able to still go back, which is nice because I can check in and kind of visit and then come back here and just kind of check out and have a little, um, um, uh, like a slower life pace, which has been great with raising the kids and, you know, they can ride their bikes around the neighborhood and like go play across the street with the neighborhood kids. And that's been really cool. Well, next time you're in LA with the kids, let me know. And if I'm there at the same time, we'll have to do like our beach date. Remember we used to do the beach. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. That was so much fun. And I would love to see your kids. I, I can't believe that they're like so old. I know. So wrapping it all up, what is your favorite memory? If you had to pick just one from Girls Next Door. My favorite memory. Gosh, there's like so many. Um. Yeah, this sounds stupid, but I, I honestly do think it's uh, it was just being involved in something so historic and it's more of a general answer. Um, but, you know, to, to date, like it's the longest running show I've ever worked on. It's the show that's gone the most seasons. It's with like notable, you know, historical figure like Hugh Hefner. Um, and also, I think it was the first of its kind where it wasn't about all the things that people were maybe hoping it would be, but glad it wasn't because we got to see your point of views and we got to see, you know, it was empowering, I think to women, you know, at least what we presented. Um, It was a great show. It really was. It was a lot of fun. And what would you say was the craziest, funnest, weirdest, memory you have of the mansion or the girls next door shows ever see any weird shit in the grotto well you know i go and peek in there and see if i could um okay 50th anniversary party not that this is like so outrageous but it is kind of cool i was there as a guest and i smoked a joint with jimmy kimmel and adam carolla that's fucking fun yeah so fun right i love that (laughs) So that was fun. Um, Yeah. I mean, lots of, look, I always used to also get this really weird vibe. I don't know. Maybe you guys did too, but in the mirrored room, like off the game room, weird vibe, right? Yeah. The van room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's going on in there? (laughs) A lot has gone down in there for sure. If those mirrors could talk. (laughs) That's the truth. (laughs) so fun it's just such good memories it is so becca thank you so much for joining us you have no idea how much fun this interview was for us and how there's nothing i'd rather do than just spend an afternoon chatting with you so it made my whole day yeah yay so fun. And thank you so much And if you guys would like more content, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girlsnextlevel. If you'd like to check out our merch, it's at girlsnextlevel.shop. And we will see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. For more content, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girlsnextlevel.